What's up, people of the Mojave Wasteland? It's time for another milestone special because we passed the 1,000 mile mark. And as for this milestone, we're gonna make it a little different, but just as fun. Just a heads up, yes, we're starting in Vault 3, and just like in the Talon Company Merc run, we're at a bit of a higher level 6, actually. But more than that, the Fiends are actually friendly to us. That's because I'm using the Fiends in Me mod. This mod, as well as all others I use, can be found and are credited in the description below. That said, a good old Tuco, haven't you wondered what he'd be like here in the Mojave Wasteland? Nah, just me. Alright then, well, we're gonna run him anyway. I'll be taking a couple of liberties here because I do want to do some NCR quests because there's a ton of them, so the XP and reward gain is always great. Plus, there are plenty of NCR characters who would do some manner of business with our hero. Looking at you, Sergeant Contreras and Tyrone. Also, Chomps Lewis from Sloan. And maybe Lieutenant Boyd because, as our favorite Tio says, he thinks he's a boxer. For Tuco's special allocation, I went with 7 Strength, 6 Perception, 8 Endurance, 1 Charisma, 4 Intelligence, 7 Agility, 7 Luck. For once, dumping Charisma actually makes sense for a New Vegas run. For Intelligence, because I want the Comprehension and Educated perks, and otherwise I would just buy the Intelligence implants anyway. But Tuco is a pretty tough dude, so the high physical stats make sense, and 7 Luck for better crits, and he's pretty lucky or unlucky, depending on your perspective, to be born into the Salamanca family. Starting off our run at level 6 due to having to find Vault 3, as well as uncovering some other areas for fast travel convenience and the minor encounters I had to deal with along the way, the perks we currently have are Rapid Reload, Educated Comprehension. As for what we're allowing Tuco to use, I took from what he uses in the show. I went with a 9mm because he uses a handgun to accost Walter while Jesse is forced to drive him, Tuco, to the White Residence. Assault Carbine because he uses an AR in his shootout with Hank Schrader. A combat knife because that knife we see him use to intimidate Jesse sure isn't your run-of-the-mill knife. And because we know Tuco loves to punch people, just ask Nodo, so he can attest to that. He can use any unarmed weapon up until brass and spiked knuckles, so no power fist, no ballistic fist, no displacer glove. Brass and spiked knuckles and anything below that is allowed. Oh, and I vaguely remember in BCS the detail about how Nacho became Tuco's right-hand man. And that's because Tuco took a shotgun to Nacho's predecessor, so we're gonna add a single shotgun to that as well. Been a minute since I've watched either show, but I think I got all our bases covered. Oh uh, yeah, he did have a snub nose in BCS as well, so we've got a fair bit to work with. Though I'm not sure if we're gonna get around to using all the weapons available to us. Uh, not sure yet, we'll see. As for traits, I took skill because Tuco got mad skill, and built to destroy because that is the most Tuco trait ever. Oh, and because Tuco rocks out with fancy clothes, we're starting him off with Benny's suit. And believe it or not, we will find ourselves an upgrade, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. And that's some Brooklyn Bridge level shenanigans right there. That said, we are allowed to use any variant of the weapons available to us, so since Tuco starts with a 9mm, we can get Maria once we take out Benny. I think that's thematically fitting too, since I seem to remember Tuco's pistol being a kinda silvery color. Those of you who have been with the channel for a while now know that I love to set up alternate timeline narratives for my challenge videos, and we're gonna do the same for our favorite Kingpin. You see, when Hank sent Tuco to Belize, that's not entirely accurate. Tuco didn't go to Belize, he just spawned here in the Fallout universe. And how lucky for our Salamanca bro here. And there is a lot of potential business to be had here, so let's go ahead and set the scene. Tuco is partnered up with the Great Cons with no Heisenberg. His partners are Jack and Diane. But like with Walt and Jesse, Tuco's the boss. He's tight, tight, tight with Motor Runner of the Fiends, who are some of his best customers. And funny enough, Tuco doesn't have any beef with the NCR. Their overextension and general incompetence may as well be free real estate for him. Also, since Tuco is an ex-con, he's on good terms with the Powder Gangers. Uh, con as in convict, not con as in great con. Tuco may have established himself as the head of what he'll see as the revival of the Salamanca family, but since there's still plenty of work to do, and our hero's not afraid to get his hands dirty, and just because he has one foot in the proverbial door of the Mojave doesn't mean there isn't more to do, and there's more he can't do to expand his influence, so he's gonna try. So, our first order of business is to hit up this little settlement called Prim. As mentioned before, we're on good terms with the Powder Gangers, but there seems to be a small group that went off and did their own thing. Well, 
They still owe our boy Tuco some money, and they're about to pay up one way or another. Yeah, Tuco did hear something on the radio. Something about a courier getting murdered on a cemetery overlooking another settlement. Good Springs. I mean, we don't really care about that. Sounds like something that would have happened back at home. That's what the guy gets for holding something of great value and not protecting himself. So says our hero. Now, the Bison Steve is normally very easy, as it's meant to serve as the introduction to dungeon-esque areas in this game. So, at level 6, our hero is not going to have any problems making an example out of these guys. With the recent news of Prim Sheriff getting killed, leaving only the deputy as the town's means of law enforcement, this does seem like a good place to get some business deals going. Just gotta make sure we grab that key so we don't have to do that lockpick check. Take out this inept convict here. More looting, and we can't forget to pick up that Tales of a Junktown vendor book. That'll be a solid plus four to our barter chat, courtesy of Comprehension. Oh, and you'll have noticed that our 9mm pistol has mods on it. Weapon mods, whether they're from GRA or from independent vendors, of course are allowed. All in all, this place is pretty much a sweep. While we mop up the remaining enemies in the Bison Steve, going back to mods for a sec, in addition to the fiends and me, you might have noticed our combat knife looks a little different, the one we used against the Mr. Steel bots earlier on. That came from a mod which adds custom Talon Company Merc gear. This was modeled after the Courier Stash DLC and, in my opinion, is very cool. I was thinking about allowing the use of the Hardened Assault Rifle, which is a customized Chinese AR, which Talon Company Mercs frequently use, but I wanted to go with something a little different for this run, and the Assault Carbine looks more in line with what Tuco uses in his last episode. And, well, after we take out the remaining Lawman of Prim, which basically makes Prim property of the Salamancas, one more mod I want to show off to you, and this is one I really, really like. Notice how all the alcoholic beverages have different effects, much different from what we're used to in the vanilla game. That mod is called Better Booze, and it's one of the first mods I ever used casually. It fixes the rather bland design of the alcohol and, well, makes them awesome. If there's any mod I recommend for any playthrough you do, it's definitely Better Booze. Oh, and one final note, our tag skills. I didn't go over that. Guns, melee weapons, and survival. I mean, if you've seen Better Call Saul, you'll know that Tuco is an excellent cook, so survival felt just right for making some great recipes that'll help enhance our survival, no pun intended. I don't know about you guys, but I would totally try some of Tuco's cooking. Next up, we're heading to Nipton to pick up our payment, and turns out somebody else is here, and luckily for us, we brought someone in tow who shall we say, hates this gang as much as we do. Although, actually, no, Boone probably hates it more than we do, but it's close, you know. The feelings are mutual here, that's the point. Back in Novak, Tuca made a quick Benjamin by doing Boone a solid. The Legion is for sure our Salamanca Protag's number one enemy, which is also a bit problematic because Papa Khan wants to ally with Caesar, and Tuca ain't about to let that slide. So the obvious solution is to neutralize the Legion at every possible point. And wouldn't you know it, Mayor Stein was one of our best-paying customers, considering what he did to Nipton during his time here as mayor. Including Mayor Sten in a what-if scenario, that's something I never thought I'd do, but hey, that's the magic of a milestone special. Anyway, Boone and Tuco make very short work of Wolpez and Colta, as well as his little group of recruit legionaries. Tuco does like the cut of the jib that is crucifixion, but since there are some of his guys on the cross, he's putting them out of their misery. Continuing with the neutralization of the Legion's military presence, Boone gives our Kingpin Protag a pointer. Boone is familiar with Cottonwood Co. for personal reasons, and it just so happens that Tuco got a magazine to refresh his lockpick skills for this imminent barrel of fun. I swear, one day I will rescue the Weathers family. Tuco obviously wouldn't care even if he knew they were down there, but I've come to realize that any time I've done this in a challenge run for FNV, they've just been added to the casualties. Although I guess the silver lining is every character we've run who has done this exact thing, unleashing the barrels, isn't even aware that they're down there. And although the radioactive barrels killed most of the legionaries, there are a couple of survivors, much to Boone's great delight, and that bloodlust for the legion, that definitely has Tuco's attention. It's got a little scheme brewing, and while I wouldn't call Tuco a mastermind by any means, he is pretty people savvy because, well, I'll give you three words, human lie detector. And the last remaining Legionary turns out to be a Legion Explorer, who I'm pretty sure is the one who comes up and runs to you, asking why you've come to Cottonwood Cove. Tuco just pretends that that guy is the same guy he shanked while in prison, which got his six-month sentence extended by quite a bit. 
At least now he has someone to take that out on without fear of repercussion. Making our way to Camp Forlorn Hope, Sergeant Cooper here is addressing Boone, not our main character. Boone says that Tuco is a recent acquaintance of his, a recent associate, if you will, who is all down to take out the Legion here at Nelson. Uh, paraphrasing that, of course, because I can never picture Boone saying someone be down with doing something. We have a small handful of NCR troopers, courtesy of an ever-so-slight boost in morale. One of these days, I'm gonna have to do this quest with NCR Rangers as reinforcements. Hey, question. Since Rangers can join the fight here if morale is high enough, if we cash in on the bounty for Nephi, where we can get First Recon to help us take him down, can they also participate in this fight? I only recently found out why sometimes I seem to get more NCR troopers in some runs compared to others, courtesy of a few viewers leaving awesome and helpful comments to fill in that blank for me. And I figure since First Recon gets sent over to Camp Forlorn Hope after Nephi is dealt with, maybe they can join the fight too? Because if so, that'd be friggin' awesome, and I would love to see that. Would totally strive for it in a challenge run, too. And if not, hey, at least we can get some NCR Ranger reinforcements in a future run. Now, we can get another history point for Boone if we untie the NCR troopers who have been crucified by Dead Sea in his contraburnium. In character, Tuka wouldn't care about those guys, but he would still let them free because while he's riding the blue high, would think, hey, I can get these guys down and they can help. Yeah! And then when they run off because they are gravely injured, he gets angry and decides to take out his chem-induced frustration out on the very people he and Boone are here to kill. Such an inspiring man, curbing his tendencies and channeling them into something positive. Our exchange with Dead Sea is a pretty interesting one this time around. A couple of our NCR troopers fall in battle, but that is to be expected. Tuco and Boone are the real muscle behind this operation, and what really matters here is that we take out Nelson no matter what. Sure, the NCR will claim it, but better to work with a potential, certainly eventual enemy, as opposed to a guaranteed enemy who would take great delight in dismembering our protagonist. Tuka might be a little crazy, but he's no fool. With our business concluded, we can report back to Camp Forlorn Hope, report to Major Pilati, and then we can be on our way. Now, just in case you thought we were buttering up to the NCR in any way, oh no. See, what we have to really do is bolster our numbers, and the best way for us to do that to expand what will become Salamanca influence is to go help our friends over at the Powder Gangers from the NCRCF, and we're going to start off by taking over Good Springs ourselves. And with the history points that we've garnered for Boone so far, we're starting to lead him down a path that, let's say, is going to absolve him of being held back by his conscience. If you're familiar with Boone's personal quest, you know that the second option can lead him down a very dark path. And if we're ever going to bring that out of him, we're going to do that here in the Tuco Run. Not much to say about Good Springs itself. Very easy. A militia, an ex-first recon, and some convicts. Yeah, Good Springs stood no chance. All we gotta do now is head on over to Joe Cobb, tell him that he's in charge of this area to make sure we get those distributions going and all that good stuff. And Chet sat out, so we also have a weapons dealer here. So we send Boone back to Novak just so he can rest up. He's earned it. We also have to go to the NCRCF and help out our buddies because while we were kicking some butt over at Good Springs, the NCR decided they're going to try to attack the prison and, well, Tuco is very happy to give every single one of these NCR trooper invaders the no-dose experience. Now you'll notice that we have the Recompense of the Fallen, which is a unique fist weapon that we can get from Cottonwood Cove. You get that from Kenturian Phoenix's desk, and because he got gassed by radioactive waste along with most of the other legionaries, well, it's not like he needed those NCR dog tags anymore, so we're gonna use them. Combine that with Stealth Boy usage, and this might be the most one-sided beatdown I've ever personally given the NCR here at the NCRCF. And now, see, I don't personally mind taking a dip in NCR reputation, because we're gonna get that eventually anyway. Uh, but the way that Tuco is able to stealth through here and still beat these guys down, well, I'd say that would make Solid Snake and Gray Fox very proud. Uh, there's a couple of times where we're real close to being discovered going from caution to danger, but that never happens. Thanks to Tuco taking up for his brothers in arms back here at the NCRCF, these guys stand absolutely no chance and were some of the funniest kills I've ever gotten. Might not be over the top like bloody mess, but there's nothing like watching them walk around trying to find you, and then they're just getting punched until they stop moving. And word has it that our buddies, the Great Cons, are held up at Boulder City, so Tuco makes his way there and has a fun little shootout with Lieutenant Monroe. Shame this guy is not packing like the old ASAC we all know and love. 
Now, as we get ready to head on inside, and I'm thinking of a way to get through this without getting riddled with bullets, as we're ready to bank the corner here, turns out the NCR is already engaging with the Great Khan, so that's perfect for us. All we have to do is switch over to the Recompense of the Fallen and beat them with the names of their allies who have fallen in battle. What a fitting way to take them out. And what's even better is that we can take these dog tags and then submit them to Quartermaster Hayes back at Camp Forlorn Hope for a little bit of cash. Just like back at the NCRCF, Tuco lays a beatdown on the NCR and saves his minions. And I like to think that this cements his dominance over the Great Cons as well as the Powder Gangers. And because Tuco's in a good mood, a pretty darn good mood, as he heads into the store where Jessup is held up, he tells him that he better not mess this up again, something, a mercy, that Tuco doesn't typically extend more than once, if ever. Once we're done here, we can go in and cash in on our level up. We hit level 10, and I'm trying to get science to 50 because I do want to complete Abadaba Honeymoon, which does require a science skill of 50. I could have sworn there was one that required a Survival 75 check, but maybe that was with a mod or something? And after all that antagonizing of the NCR to the point where we're at soft-hearted devil rating with them, how are we gonna get into the strip? Sure, we could do the credit check, but Salamakas don't do credit checks. Well, we can make use of the NCR mantle armor and troop helmet we picked up. Tuco can lose all his cool and style and dress up as a grunt soldier of the NCR. Now you'd think that the upcoming guards would at least check and pat us down, but apparently not. Kent McCarran, by the standards of the NCR in the Mojave, is high security, but since our boy remembers the old days of the pre-war, man, this is way too easy. If only it was like this back in Albuquerque. Actually, that makes me think, How? what do you think Albuquerque is like here in the Fallout universe? After telling the one trooper that it's none of his business why we're here, we end up bumping into this strange robot that Tuco canonically has not seen before. And after we go ahead and exit so that we can get the fast travel point for the Strip North Gate, well, the robot said something about the Lucky 38, and we have a Lucky 38 VIP card which we picked up from Camp Golf. Chief Handlin been buying Mentats under the table, you know, to cope with what he's been doing under the table. Tuco finds himself in the penthouse of the Lucky 38, and Mr. House is there waiting to greet him, but Tuco's like, nah, check this out, I think I know what this card does. Hey, sweet, it goes into the computer, and it opened up this secret passageway. What's inside, I wonder? Whoever's back here is gonna experience a clubbing trip. Ah, Mr. House thinks to do business with Tuco Salamanca, but can't be bothered to show up himself? Well, now we don't have to worry about that anymore. But Tuco is actually here at the Strip for a reason. See, just like with the Great Cons and how Benny screwed them out of not paying them, Benny came to Tuco and was able to convince him to get him some camps that he'd pay for them later, so that his con minions could go ahead and have some extra motivation, as it were. Swike knows exactly who this is. He's like, yo, I'm not even gonna get in your way. Benny's upstairs, man. Just, uh, just try to keep it clean, all right? Swike says keep it clean. All right, it's, it's clean. It's all good. Hey, Benny almost fought back this time. Benny even stole Tuco's style. The nerve of that guy. So after we go rummaging through Benny's room, we find this other robot of his, one yes man, and... Ho ho ho, when they're done here, too, because, like, we're gonna make a lot of money together. Yes, man's like, oh god, help me. And apparently, Kaisar has given Tuco the mark of Kaisar. It's been a minute since we've come to the fort and not riddled it with holes. Kaisar, being as well-versed in history as he is, knows exactly who Tuco Salamanca is and wants him on his side. Because, I mean, who wouldn't want to ingratiate themselves with Tuco? Thanks to Programmer's Digest and our 75 science score, we're able to just waltz our way on through the Securitron bunker and take care of business. Kaisar wants us to blow it up, but <laughs> nah, we ain't gonna do that. Kaisar believes us anyway, and then Tuco tells him to get bent, and Kaisar starts issuing a bunch of threats, and Tuco just laughs in his face because, I mean, it's not like Kaisar is actually gonna do anything to us. Could see a couple of his Praetorians just exchanging glances, being like, yo, maybe we're working for the wrong guy here. And despite all that, we are, in fact, accepted by the Legion. Cool. Well, we can take advantage of the Legion Dropbox a couple of times. After successfully convincing Papa Khan's four big advisors to go against Kaisar's Legion, we tell Papa Khan to just go ahead and send in his mooks who want to go fight one last time because they're all worthless, except for the ones who really matter like Jack, Diane, and of course, our waifu Great Khan Armorer. We hit Idolize, cash in on our level up, and let's go pay a visit to the Omertas. They trying to do business on Salamanca turf, and, well, turns out that they are informants for the Legion, and we just can't have that. A good thing we're not cashing in on side bets, because we are still taking advantage of those Legion drop boxes. 
with Kachino on Team Salamanca. Let's head on over to the White Glove Society and see if we can't get one of those guys to support us. Well, I don't think that Marjorie would be on Team Salamanca. Mortimer, on the other hand, although Tuco doesn't partake in the craving, if you will, I do think that Mortimer would be far more tolerant of it. As long as Mortimer keeps his bizzo under wraps, I can see Tuco looking the other way because I can't really see him judging what Mortimer is all about. We're taking over New Vegas, we can't afford to be picky about our allies. With the two options to track down the initial target, or take out the guy who's already in the freezer, I mean, hey, what else can Tuco just be himself and shoot at someone he doesn't like? After making Gunderson think he has a shot at escaping, we gun him down, and then we drag him back onto the freezer just as a little favor for our new allies. And apparently when Tuco loots blood from a corpse, he's able to perfectly preserve it for the next step in this little operation here. We have to smear Ted's blood amongst whatever we want to here in their private suite. Mortimer does warn us about the two hired guns in there, but that just sounds like target practice for our hero. We'll go ahead and smear that blood on the bed and the sink, and then for no reason just spit in the toilet while we're at it, and then make our way on out of here. Last thing we have to do is head outside and inform a Securitron of a murder that took place. Heck, Gunderson has murdered his son, how dastardly. Tio Hector would be very disappointed. La familia es todo, after all. I always got a kick out of this little pre-rendered cutscene with the Securitron and Het Gunderson. Het Gunderson can deny it all we want, but we know that he's really guilty. But my favorite part is that the Securitron warns us about the dangers of a corpse, including that it's a potential tripping hazard, obviously the most dangerous thing. So we can head on back to our man Mortimer, tell him that the deed is done, and once the banquet at 7 o'clock is concluded, we can come back and fully get Mortimer on Team Salamanca. And, best of all, we can conclude the Tuco Ultralux saga by heading back outside and cashing in on a little favor we'd said we'd do for somebody because, hey, who doesn't like to make bottle caps, right? We chat up with Walter Phoebus here, and just looking at this guy gives Tuco kind of a mixed reaction. It looks familiar, but it's not Heisenberg. It's not Heisenberg, Tuco. Just relax, relax. Oh, and just in case you thought I was joking about the Legion drop boxes because we are currently accepted with the Legion, I like to think that this is Kaiser's way of trying to pay off Tuco from sabotaging the Legion's efforts any more than he already has. Well, we do appreciate the free loot that we're getting here. We can sell that for quite a bit of money. But, uh, Tuco never agreed to this, so it's just free stuff at their expense. Now, most of the characters we run on this channel do see taking out the Brotherhood as the ideal solution. And yes, Yes Man wants, <coughs> highly suggests that we take care of the Hidden Valley Bunker. But where Yes Man sees a problem, Tuco sees potential buyers. Now, obviously, we're not going to do the entirety of the Brotherhood quest line because, I mean, he has other people to do that for him. But we're going to help out a little bit just to, just to sweeten the pot a bit, if you know what I mean. We can get Initiate Stanton's missing laser pistol form and then turn it into Knight Torres. We could then give Initiate Stanton and Apprentice Watkins a little treat to go along with their late missing laser pistol. Also, that means Veronica finally gets to survive. Hooray! And searching for those missing patrols will take us all the way up to Nellis Air Force Base. As we rest up for a bit in the field shack because even Tuco needs a bit of a breather. Our hero ends up seeing yet another familiar face in the form of one... Joe boy And he's familiar because he stole from the Salamancas. He stole 427 bottle caps and that ain't about to fly. I mean, geez, Benny tried to rip him off and then Joe boy flat out steals Salamanca property. We'll go ahead and set Veronica on wait while we run through the Nellis Artillery Barrage. Seems like lately we've been doing pretty good as far as this part of our runs go, taking only minor damage and one crippled limb by the end of it. Now, you would think that Tuco would want these guys gone ASAP for putting him through that, but just recall how Heisenberg and Tuco started doing business together. There's just something about a crazy display of strength and dominance that really gets Tuco's respect, so yes, he is going to help out the Boomers, and by that, I mean he has a ton of scrap metal that he's been collecting throughout the course of the run, so we're just going to give that to Jack. I will do the other quests just for the sake of XP, but yeah. Tuco even gets Jack to try out some of his goodies because that might give him the courage to go approach Janet on his own. Tuco makes sure that George Boy is actually dead, and yeah, he's satisfied with that. So we can go up to Veronica, set her to follow, and then we can go get that last report from the now dead patrol. And once we're done doing that, of course Veronica's gonna hold on to the power armor because she can use it. That's gonna help her quite a bit. 
We're gonna backtrack on over to Novak because, uh, yeah, that's right. We said we'd do Manny Vargas this little favor because he's technically a former con. And I can see him get doing a little bit of a side business with our hero here. Turns out that Tuco's generosity pays off because the Nightkin, I mean, they're blue like his favorite, um, product. And hearing about their, um, craving for stealth boys, that gives our boy an idea. All we need to do is get by Harland here. No problem for Tuco. One shot for Maria takes his head clean off. We can go upstairs, find out that there are, in fact, no stealth boys, but that's okay because I think Tuco just found himself a bit of a gold mine here. A new type of customer, if you will. And new customers would have included the Bright Brotherhood, but they want to leave, and Tuco's not all that thrilled about it. He thinks here, what would Heisenberg do to these guys? Oh man, come on, he was smart. Taking some Mentats and reading a Programmer's Digest, he's like, Oh yeah, I can set the rockets to crash into each other. I'm sure that's not gonna have any ramifications later on. And I mean, hey, Tuco's never set up fireworks before, not even during the pre-war, so new experience. Just imagine you're Jason Brett or one of those ghouls, you're like, Ah, oh, finally, our dream's about to be realized. Wait, and then they're wondering why the rockets are acting up the way they are. Oh, we're getting too close and we're gone. After that, we can swing back on up towards Nellis. By Nellis, I mean Calville Bay. Raise that bomber, that should totally be nothing but dust because it's been in the lake for 300 years. Very generous of the water to do that. We'll get better springs on our map, go get Boone, and then we're going to do his personal quest. Something I really wanted to do in my Talon run, but say la vie, I guess. Boone laments better springs, Tuco told him he should have brought more ammunition. And yes, we are now at Evil Karma. Real talk, I've been mostly making evil decisions at this point, and without the fiends to worry about, because FNV says you gain positive karma for killing fiends, even if it's self-defense or being interested in Daughtry's bounty, it's still been a bit of a struggle to maintain that. Honestly, killing Wolpes, who is marked as very evil, didn't do us any favors, but hey, at least we're getting Tuco's karma around where it should be. He may have died a villain, but here in the Mojave Wasteland, he's been living long enough to see himself become a hero. Now, we all know Tuco don't care about the Better Springs refugees, except for the fact that well, you know what I'm about to say by now. Potential customers are here, so it's worth protecting that investment. Plus, Boone wants to come here. The Bitter Springs Massacre, although the Great Cons acting the way they did is what led to this incident, is an event that Boone is still struggling with, along with many other things. For Tuco, however, it's about sending a message, not just to the Legion, but to his recent associate. As mentioned earlier, Boone has one of two endings that he can get if you complete his character quest, and assuming that he doesn't die, of course. The second one being there's no job that Boone won't take on, no target too innocent. Well, by the end of this real one-sided beatdown with Tuco and Boone just dominating the Legion raiding party here. And yes, the irony of Tuco seeing in blue, thanks Cat's Eye, is not lost on me. Anyways, as our hero comes down from riding his blue high, Boone approaches him and talks about how he's still confused by all this, and Tuco basically tells him to get over himself that, hey, it's war, people die, people die all the time, even out of war. And even Tuco is surprised that Boone takes this to heart. Tuco tells him to embrace vengeance, and, well, Boone is no longer held in check by his conscience, so we could say that Boone becomes to Tuco what Mike Ermintrout was to Gustavo Fring. What a character arc for our favorite kingpin. Alright, now that we have Boone as an enforcer for the Salamanca family, let's head on back to Freeside and start cleaning things up a bit. Things have been getting a little dicey since we've been gone. Plus, there's something that Tuco really, really wants to do in Freeside anyway. Tuco is a big fan of the Atomic Wrangler, so of course he's going to help out Francine with her little errands, but turns out there's somebody here trying to sell on Salamanca turf, and we all know what happened the last time someone tried that. Combo sure does anyway. Our boy Dixon gets the no-dose treatment, and after making an example out of him, it's time for Tuco to get rid of what could be a serious thorn in his side. Tuco's all ready to kick down the door to the king's room and start blasting, but when he's not there, well, that random king grunt who smarted him off is going to be perfect for starting off this little gang war. Heading back downstairs, we get the jump on the second of many king's members who are going to fall, and that does earn the attention of... Pacer and another King's member. Been wanting to take out Pacer for quite a while in one of these challenges. As Pacer goes down and we help ourselves to his mediocre loot, we hit Unpredictable with Freeside. Very fitting for Tuco. 
We bank the corner Sergio might not want to fight, but he is still a member of the Kings, and all Kings gang members are going down. And not just in here, but we'll take out the ones outside as well, which I'm sure Oris will be very grateful for. With Pacer's Key, we can open the door to the main room here, take out that King's gang member who's singing despite the fact he would certainly be hearing all this gunfire. The second one goes down, we'll switch to Recompense of the Fallen to take out Rex. Would have been a nice companion, but hey, he's part of the King, so Tuco just considers that part of the collateral. And as for the head honcho himself, the King tries he might, still goes down. And I mentioned earlier that we'll get an upgrade to Benny's suit. Viva Las Vegas, that's how Tuco really rocks out in style. But we don't want to put it on just yet. There's a couple more King's Gang members outside that we have to take care of. And as we finish them off, we're going to head over to the Van Graffs. Boone can go ahead and take care of guard duty. And the other grunt work all the while, we have brought Rose of Sharon Cassidy to Jean-Baptiste. We're going to need some reliable muscle if we're to expand the influence of the Salamancas here. And there's one more thing that the Van Graffs need, and we're going to send Boone to go take care of that little meaning. Something I'm sure he's going to relish in. While that goes down, we're going to go to Bonnie Springs with our pal Veronica to take out the last of the Vipers. Now, our hero doesn't have the same disposition of Veronica that he does towards Boone. He does respect the fact that Veronica can throw down fisticuffs. She's not part of Tuco's forces, but instead is a nice little in-between between him and the Brotherhood of Steel. And no, she does not help with distribution. She would not do that. After taking out the Viper Leader, we get Love and Hate, the best fist weapons that we have access to, so we are absolutely going to make use of that going forward. The icing on the cake is that it's one of my favorite weapons in the entire game. Turns out there's a second Viper Leader who's raining down grenades on us, and although we're able to take him out, <laughs> unfortunately Veronica dies. I didn't mean for that to happen, so uh, Veronica's death count in my challenge runs is still going. And yeah, I know, I could have just reloaded to save and prevented that, but if we're trying to tell a story here, I'd rather keep it as genuine as I possibly can. But hey, on the bright side, Veronica gave her life for a better cause. Remember back at Novak Repcon when we helped out the Night Can? Well, don't think that that was a one-off here. Oh, no. Here's a little recap of Tuco's adventure to Jacobstown as he and Blue Abloida take out the Night Stalkers here in Charleston Cave. Came here originally because I wanted the snow globe, and I cashed that in before we took out Mr. House. Came back, Marcus needed some help with getting some NCR-hired mercenaries to back off, and he wanted to settle it peacefully. Okay, fine, there's some customers here at the Nightkin for Tuco, so he's gonna go about it how Marcus wants to. Except for the fact that the mercenaries demanded 2,500 bottle caps in order to be paid enough to go away. So Tuco told Marcus the cost was 3000 so he used that money to pay off the mercenaries and kept five Benjamins for himself. Now that's business etiquette we should all strive for. And now those of you who are familiar with the character quest of Lily Bowen probably know what direction Tuco is going to take that to, and thankfully it's very easy to start that quest and very easy to complete it. I can see Tuco having some respect for her because of that holotape she listens to which reminds her of her family, it is, after all, all that remains of her human life before she became a Nightkin and served in the Master's Army. I'd say Tuka would have liked a holotape for that, but I'm pretty sure he'll never forget the ringing of Teo's bell. So the plan is to get that chewed stealth boy for Doc Henry. Now, Keen and the other Nightkin, well, they kind of like Tuka because Tuka's all about letting them have the stealth boys because that means more money for him. And it really puts things into perspective for him. He's like, wait, so if Stealth Boys work on this on the Nightkin, will the Stealth Mark IIs have the same effect on people? Tuco's still getting used to the concept of there being anything other than humans to interact with. A Doc Henry might not like the plan, but as Tuco would say, Don't you trust me? And after Doc Henry says, no, it's not that, Tuco's in a pretty darn good mood, so he's not going to give the good doctor the Jesse Pinkman treatment. Lo and behold, believe it or not, Tuco was actually invited to help look after the president during his stay at Hoover Dam. Now, the only reason why the NCR hasn't figured out what Tuco's been doing is because Chief Hanlon has been continuing to sabotage information to look out for Tuco, because Tuco really has him by the balls. And not just because Hanlon said that turning him in would do more harm than good, uh, but Chief Hanlon has been buying some ment hats in bulk to help him kind of cope with the shame of what he's doing. So yeah, it's best not to earn the ire of our protagonist. Thanks to a good old Fixin' Things magazine, we're able to disarm the vertebrate, and just for fun, 
We're gonna go up to that engineer and steal the redundant failsafe detonator off of him as well. You know, a double dose of competence for the NCR. They could really learn a lesson from our boy Tuco here. With both of those in our possession, we can head on over to Ranger Grant. It only gives us the option to turn in one, but Tuco's gonna give them both because, I mean, he doesn't need the bomb. And it's just another way to flex over the NCR security. Well, thankfully, there's not much of an incident here. They take out that engineer who was a legionary in disguise, and once that's all said and done, we see President Kimball off in the vertebrate, and he goes off into the horizon. However, following Yes Man's suggestion, Tuco has one more pit stop to make before he goes back and then gets ready to square it down to seize Hoover Dam and claim New Vegas for himself. Uh, that first NCR trooper at El Dorado, I fought completely unarmed, and considering how much damage we were dealing completely unarmed, I'm feeling pretty good about our chances for the upcoming final battle. We'll head on over to the terminal, power up the power station, and then we are ready for the final battle. Take it away, yes man, send us to Hoover Dam. Out of all the companions who are still available to us, Tuco is, of course, bringing Lily, who is no longer taking Doc Henry's medicine, but instead taking the medicine that Tuco has been giving her. Normally, this is where we would take out the three Great Khan warriors, but since they're attacking pretty much anyone who isn't us that they see, I'll let them have their fun. They get dispatched relatively easily, like they always do. As we get ready to throw down with the first wave of Kentarians, gonna go ahead and pop some of Tuco's favorite stuff. Equip love and hate, and let the beatdown commence. So I got a question for you guys. Quick question for you guys. Out of all the chems in Fallout New Vegas, which one do you guys think would serve as the blue for Tuco? What comes closest to Heisenberg's prized creation? Let me know in the comments what you think. Uh, my personal vote is Slasher. With the East Wing secured, we can head on side of the tower here, go down to the lower floor, and we're gonna take out our favorite heavy trooper derp duo. Their hit points are severely neutered, and our unarmed skill is crazy high, and we have love and hate yet. Yeah, not gonna poke fun at these guys this time. After installing the override chip, all I have to do now is go hit a switch. Sounds pretty easy. And hey, along the way we get to take out some more legionaries. That's always a fun pastime. As we make our way over to this opening sliding door here, pop that bad boy open, go down the little walkway here, flip on that switch, and then it's time for us to go to the West Wing for round two against the Canturians of Kaisar's Legion. Well, after we take out these Prime Legionaries, Tuco can always take a little bit of time out of his day to have some fun. And when we make our way back to the surface, Tuco's in for quite the surprise. The entire walkway is shard, and turns out that Mother Pearl sent the bomber to drop some serious fulminated mercury on Kaisar's Legion. With the Kentarian's health in dire straits, we can use Maria to dispatch them. Real nice feeling to give my favorite weapon in the entire game some love in the 1K special. Maria may be far from the strongest weapon in the game, but it's certainly my favorite. It was also pretty great for going through Repcon when we were helping out Davison because of the Feral Ghouls in there. Yeah, we completed that GRA challenge real easily. Using his vast knowledge of being a pre-war relic shot into this timeline, Tuco has a good laugh at the Praetorian's expense knowing that it's not smart to bring a fist weapon to a gunfight, unless you're our hero. What makes her sneaking through the Legates camp here even better is that Lily's perk, Stealth Girl, also boosts our sneaking. It also increases the duration of Stealth Boys by 50%, stack that with Logan's Loophole and Day Tripper, and you're gonna be stealth for days. We don't have Logan's Loophole, obviously. I just thought that was kind of awesome synergy. We got two more Praetorian Guards to dispose of. Down goes one, down goes the other. Alright. Now, as we get ready to square down with Legate Lanny, is pretty pumped for this one. Well, there's a funny little thing that happens here. This veteran legionary that attacks Lily, and thus us, he really thinks he's the one. This guy thinks he's got our number. I gotta say, that's pretty gutsy of that veteran legionary. Well, was gutsy. He is now lacking a head. He wasn't thinking with it anyway. All right, last minute check here. We're good to go. Yeah, we're good to go. Now, as we make our way up the ramp here, well, I don't think Tuco has much to say to Leg Atlantis here. We already know that Tuco has made Kaisar his bitch, because not only did we get the mark of Kaisar, but we were getting Legion drop boxes too. So we take a few shots to lure the leg head over here. Turns out we hit him, not dealing much damage, but well, we're not going to be using Maria to fight him. One punch sends leg Atlantis on his back. We're going to go ahead, pop him some of that good stuff. I can stop anytime I want. Yeah, that's what Tuco tells himself, I'm sure. I <laughs> know, well, who am I kidding? No, he doesn't. So, as we're throwing fists with these Praetorians, they are fairly competent blocking some of our strikes. Legate Lanius is back on his feet, as if that matters. 
We'll take some rushing water to go with our awesome little Kemp soup there. Leg Atlantius is down. You see that plus 45 XP? Yeah, he's all tuckered out. And got a sneak peek of Lily's health bar looking real good there. We'll go ahead and take out that last Praetorian. That was pretty sweet, but we were a bit slow on the mark there, so there are a couple of reinforcements for us to take out, but again, I don't think we're going to have much trouble with those guys. I gotta admire the intensity and the integrity of these veteran legionaries coming to fight us after their weakling of a commander fell in battle. Case in point coming up here, this veteran legionary who attacked Lily again could have left and we would have been none the wiser to it, but uh, I guess he insists on joining his brothers in death. All that's left to do now is deal with General Oliver and the rest of the NCR here at Hoover Dam. Making our way on over to the Leggett's camp entrance, it gets blown open for us, which Tuko respects that kind of a grand entrance, although he doesn't respect the guy coming to meet him. Yeah, preaching to the choir on that one. And the only reason that Tuko is not immediately attacking General Oliver is because he is talking so much smack to this guy. He got played real hard, and to be fair, Tuco didn't do everything here because General Oliver is such an incompetent moron. It basically made Tuco's job here one of the easiest he's ever done. Now, we do have to be careful here. These veteran rangers are very strong, and thanks to some weaving around, we're able to take out that veteran ranger. We pop off Oliver's head just for fun, and that's the run. I really hope you guys enjoyed that run. I had something else in mind originally for my 1K special, but I was like, nah, I haven't introduced that game onto the channel yet, so I'm gonna go with this one. I had a great time with this one. I stopped so many times because I was laughing during the voiceover. I loved this run. I hope you guys did too. On screen now are some runs that you can look forward to in the future. Our next Elder Scrolls Oblivion video is going to be our first episode of the Let's Play. Next Fallout video, probably going to be Fallout 3 Faction Warriors as an Oasis Tree Minder. And I'll see you guys there. Take it easy, guys.